cold outside. Hello, my lovely morbid and awkward friends. How are you today? Hoping you're having a lovely one, wherever you are. Morning, noon, night, midnight, overnight, all of the above. I hope you're having a great one. If you're new here, hey, what's up? My name is Liz, and this is Creating Crime Time, uh, where I'm your host, and I talk about a true crime story, and most of the time, I create a work of art at the same time. So if you're interested, I would highly suggest you hit that red subscribe button and turn your notification bell onto all, because I'm here for you currently right now for the 25 days of true crime. I haven't really thought of a uh, normal uploading schedule, but... With that being said, let's get into today's true crime case, because this one is, uh, lovely. It's lovely. So, today, we are talking about the Cleveland Torso Murderer. If you don't know who the Cleveland Torso Murderer is, uh, they are also known as the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run, the Hobo Jungle Killer, Now, this was a span of crimes that happened in the 1930s in the Cleveland area, Cleveland, Ohio area, and these killings were characterized by the dismemberment of the 12 known victims and their disposal of their remains in the area around Kingsbury Run. Now, most of the victims came from east of Kingsbury, which is the Roaring Third Hobo Jungle, and... Oh, wow. It was known for its bars and vagrants and brothels and gambling dens. So people that just were having a good time, were homeless, all of the above, and transients. So despite the investigations that were led by Elliot Ness, um, who was Cleveland's public safety director, uh, the murderer was never caught, they were never apprehended, none of that. So, the official number of murders is attributed to the Cleveland Torso. Um, that's attributed to this case is 12. And in all technicality, recent research can show that it's been up to 20. Now, their known victims is between 1935 and 1938. Some investigators believe um, that there may have been 13 or more victims, and this is between Cleveland, Youngstown, and Pittsburgh areas between the 1920s and 1950s. There's two strong candidates uh, that can be added to this list, and those are the Lady of the Lake and Robert Robertson. And I will discuss those or will have discussed those in the previous video, so the day before this. So, um, the victim of the victims of these murders were generally those that their identities were never determined. Uh, there is a few exceptions. Uh, victims two, three, and eight were identified, and they were that of Edward Andrassi, uh, Florence Polillo, and Rose. Wallace. Yeah. So these victims appeared to be lower class. They so they were easy prey in a depression era in Cleveland. Uh, many were known as working poor and they had nowhere else to live except for their ramshackle houses that they made in these areas or Hoovervilles or shanty towns. And this area in specific was well, in specifics was called the Cleveland Flats. So the torso murderer always beheaded and dis often dismembered their victims. Occasionally they would sever the victim's torso in half or severing the appendages. In many cases, the cause of death is dismemberment or decapitation and most of the male victims were castrated or emasculated if you want an easier term to kind of like swallow that. Ugh. Um, many of the victims were found a considerable period of time after their deaths, which I think the furthest would be a year, almost a year. Um, so this time forensic science was truly in its infancy. They didn't know 
they didn't know how to determine a lot of things. It was hard for them. Like, we had the coroner, but the coroner can only do so much. Police didn't know how to do a lot of these things to identify these people. It was very hard for police to officially, like... It, yeah, it was very hard for police to fully do their job without fucking up a case because and oftentimes we find that cases that are from this time period most of the time their crime scenes are destroyed because we have random people coming onto these crime scenes that shouldn't be there and the cops just allowed it and everything is contaminated which I talk about in tomorrow's videos for the final day of the 25 days of true crime So, and this was, since forensic science was also in its infancy, um, this further complicated identification for these people because of the heads not being discovered. So it was harder for them to identify them by like markings on their body rather than, oh, it's their face. I know who this is. Yay. Yay. So... <clears throat> there are two suspects of this crime and one was Dr. Francis Sweeney um, and he well actually you know what we'll get into them afterwards let's talk about our victims first so in all technicality the first actual victim should be the lady of the lake but because I'm going to talk about her in another <clears throat> in the video before this, or I've talked about her in the video before this, we'll um, just focus on these 12. So this, these cases are about three that are identified and then nine that are unidentified. So <clears throat> John Doe, number one, he would be found on the 23rd of September, 1935 in so the location he was found is called Jackass Hill, and this is the area of Kingsbury Run near East 49th Street in Praha Avenue. So he was found lying about 30 feet from John Doe number one. So what they did is that John Doe number two actually became John Doe number one when they identified Edward Andrassy. Um, he... <clears throat> His autopsy showed that he had been dead for two to three days prior to being discovered. Um, he had been decapitated and emasculated and his body was found nude. And his head would eventually become, well, be recovered. <clears throat> so they believe, obviously after finding his head, they would be able to identify him. Now because they found John Doe, number one, right near him, Here's two bodies out of the, like, out of nowhere, and cops don't know what to do with about them. So, John Doe number two, he's found in the weeds of this hill area, of Jackass Hill. And now, at first, he was estimated to have died seven to ten days prior to discovery, but the coroner was quick to revise this as to having been killed three to four weeks before being discovered. So John Doe number two was actually killed before Edward Andrassy. And this was thought to have happened because his body was saturated with oil and he was set on fire. Uh, his body also, he was emasculated, he was decapitated, his head would be recovered. Um, his skin was also treated with a chemical substance that caused it to become severely red tinged and leathery and very rough. Very, very rough. So that's in 1935. A few months go by, and by a few months I mean here comes January of 1936. Now on the 26th of January in 1936, and this also, this finding goes into February. <clears throat> so a woman discovered, a woman 
discovered baskets that were next to the heart manufacturing plant. And in the, these baskets were a torso, upper legs, like the thighs, um, a right arm and a hand. And they were wrapped in newspapers that were dated one day prior to this. And this person would eventually become identified as Florence Gen Genevieve Polillo and her alias was Martin. So she would become identified after they find the remainder of her. So <clears throat> February 7th of 1936, now this is less than two weeks after more parts of her body was found in a trash pile in a vacant lot and this was on 1419 Orange Ave but her head was still missing. Yeah. Um, she was identified via fingerprint analysis which was still very new at this time. She was dead two to four days prior to discovery and they noticed that there was chicken feathers found on her body. So it was just like little, there's little weird things about each of these victims. Little, little weird things. So our next victim we're going to talk about, he doesn't have, he, okay. So technically they called him John Doe too, but he has a different name, a different title. He's called the Tattooed Man and he... I, every time I look at this case, I always see a picture of his face, and I'm like, man, if only they could identify him via his tattoos, that would be perfect. But, you know, shit happens. So, on the 5th of June in 1936, so we're going from February now to June, so just four months. We were talking about the tattooed man. Now, he was found on the 5th of June in 1936. Now, there were two boys that were walking along um, it, well near East 55th Street Bridge and beneath a tree like in a gully near the tree they would find a man's head and this would be wrapped in a pair of pants. Now next day the 6th of June they would locate the rest of his body and his body was nude left in front of the Nickel Plate Railroad Police Department. Such a smart place kind of like it's almost as if the killer is taunting these people with, <laughs> you found one part, here's the other one. Um, and just like the other victims prior to him, so the other two, other three, sorry. Just like the other three, his body was also drained of blood and it was cleaned. Now, these bodies were cleaned with, now I think it's the same way that the Black Dolly was cleaned, which wait for tomorrow. Um, I believe that their bodies would clean with gasoline and gasoline and now if you put a chemical agent on top of that, it will cause your skin to become leathery, which was the thing that was happening with these people's bodies is that their skin was leathery. So people, the police were hopeful that they would be able to identify him because of the tattoos on his body, uh, but he wouldn't be identified. <sighs> One part of this that pisses me off is that, I'm sorry, you have a man covered in tattoos. Now, clearly he worked. He's a hard worker. He paid for those tattoos. I mean, unless he was a sex worker, that's totally plausible. But tattoo artists in the area, since this was the mid 30s there's not going to be a lot of them they're going to be scarce and few and far between so they would know exactly who these people are that would get a tattoo or they would be ex-military so that's another theory i have not one that's like a publicized one is that i think that the tattooed man is like an ex-military personnel so um, it, the coroner determined that he had died two days prior to recovery and he was around 25 years old and he was also decapitated. So John Doe, number three, uh, he would be discovered a month later, like a month and two weeks later. Yay! So 26th of July, 1936. 
he would be discovered. Now he was discovered by a girl walking in the woods near Big Creek in Clinton Road. Now this was in Brooklyn, Ohio. And in this area was also a homeless camp. And she came across the body of a nude man. Now the coroner would determine that because there was Around him, there was blood found seeped into the ground. This is where they determined that this is where he was killed. And this was unlike any of the other victims they had discovered so far, where they had clearly been put there and, like, placed there. This guy would died there. Um, and near him was bloody, cheaply made clothing. And because of this and because of his hair... It's speculated that he was homeless or he had rode in or out of the city through the train tracks, which were which were close by. Um, and also basing off of his clothing, his long hair, and the proximity to the homeless camp, they thought that he was homeless or just a transient. Now, they determined that he was 40 years old and the cause of death was decapitation. And he had been dead for between two to three months. Fast forward to 10th of September of 1936. The upper torso of a nude man was found by a homeless man after he had tripped over it. Now there's there's a lot of different versions of this, so this is the first one I found, so I'm going to stick with it, is that this homeless man tripped over the torso while he was trying to catch a train, and this was at the East 37th Street um, like train station in Kingsbury Run. Like I saw one where it still has to do with this homeless dude, but like he saw the torso in a sewer, which goes along like in where they find more of this person. But there's a lot of like speculation when it comes to how they first found him. I don't know. I don't know. Um, police would search for additional remains, but they would only find the victim's lower torso and legs in the sewer. This is after they had a diver go down. Now, while the diver went down, there was a crowd of over 600 people that were watching him. Because, I mean, they just discovered another body, so there's going to be a giant crowd. Here comes contamination of a crime scene again. Woo! Woo! So this, this death, although, although, also is a lot different when it comes to the other ones, is because the coroner had discovered, obviously he died from decapitation, but there was no hesitation marks. So when some, when some people cut people up, dismember them, uh, there's going to be a hesitation mark. Well, this dude didn't have a hesitation mark whatsoever. Whatsoever. Yeah. Oh, and from this, uh, he also determined that the killer was strong, confident, and familiar with human anatomy. Um, this also ties into my case for tomorrow. And this is due to, like, all of this is due to the head having been cut off in one strong, clean stroke. He, John Doe, was estimated to be in his late 20s and that he had been dead for about two days prior to discovery. Fast forward to the 23rd of February, 1937. A woman's torso had washed up on the shore of Bratton Hall, uh, which was near... Lakeshore Boulevard and also people say this is Euclid Euclid Lake which this ties into the Lady of the Lake yeah yeah she so this is Jane Doe number one she was found close to where the Lady of the Lake was discovered so this is how they those two tie in together because it's on the same like hunting grounds basically if you think about it in a really strange way 
<sighs> yeah, so that's in February they found the torso. In May, so three months later, the bottom half of her was had washed up near East 30th Street. And she was believed to have been in her mid-20s, and she remains unidentified. She was decapitated. That was her cause of death. She had been dead for two to four days. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, next we're going to talk about the third and final identified victim. This would be Jane Doe number two, and she would be identified as Rose Wallace. So, uh, 6th of June in 1937, a teenage boy discovered a human skull under the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge. Um, next to it was a burlap bag, and in the burlap bag contained the dismembered, rotting remains of what turned out to be a petite African-American woman's, like, torso. Yeah. And this woman would be about 40 years old. Now... Because dental work was still, like, not as, um, it, uh, dental ID was not fully there. So they made a kind of positive but unofficial identification of this body due to her extensive dental work. Now, she had fillings and caps and stuff like that, so they were able to identify her as Rose Wallace. And... She had been dead for about a year prior to discovery. They believe that she died in June 1936. Yeah. Yeah. And she, so Rose Wallace lived in the Scoville Avenue area. And she is also known to have been a sex worker. I can't stand when they add that in there. You're a sex worker. You're a sex worker. I'm sorry. A lot of people did things that they they didn't want to for money at that time. So what else are you going to expect? <clears throat> so uh, we are now just going to the next month because literally it is a month afterward. The 6th of July of 1937. The... So... I also found like three different versions of this and I'm going to stick with the first one that I found. Now a guardsman stood watch um, by the West, th West Third Street Bridge and he saw a piece of what would be John Doe, the, or John Doe number five. So he saw a piece of him moving. Now this is after a tugboat had moved through. So he saw part of him move in the wake, so in like the waves after the tugboat had gone through. What a beautiful procession of body pots. Over the next few days, police would recover the entire body except for the head from the Cuyahoga River. Over the next few days, the police would recover the entire body except for the head from the Cuyahoga River. So his manner of brutality with this body was a lot different. The heart had been ripped out and his abdomen had been gutted. This showed a new vicious element for this killer. Um, he His cause of death was decapitation and he had only been dead for about one to two days. And this John Doe was aged to be in his late 30s. He there wouldn't be another murder until April of the following year. So we go to April 8th, 1938. And this is when a young laborer who's on his way to work in the flats, so the Cleveland Flats, um, he saw what looked like a dead fish in the water in near the banks of the Cuyahoga River. And when he got closer, it's then he realized that it was a human, like a lower laugh of a lower laugh, a lower half of a woman's leg. And, um, so the next month, police pulled out two burlap bags out of the river, and this contained both parts of the torso and most of the rest of her legs. <sighs> this 
would be kind of like a turning point when it came to this case because this is when the coroner Gerber, now he's been the coroner that's presided over all of these cases. He found drugs in her system. Now he couldn't determine whether it was to tranquilize her or because she was a drug addict and he wouldn't be able to tell unless he had arms. Well that was the only part of her that they didn't find other than her head was her arms. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. Also in the bags there was a left foot and another thigh. So it Coroner Gerber determined that she had been dead for two, three to five days. Her cause of death was decapitation. She had light brown hair. And there was significant damage, like internal and external damage when it came to her body. Her cervix was damaged. Now, he took this as either she gave birth, like, not long before this happened or from having an abortion. And she also had a C-section scar. So this is clearly a woman that has had children. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. So the last two that were found were found on the same day. And we will move from April now to August, on August 16th of 1938. And this is when they discovered John, the Jane Doe the fourth and John Doe the sixth. Now, three scrap collectors were foraging in a dumping site at the East Ninth and Lakeside, um, and they found the torso of a woman. Now, the woman's torso was wrapped in a men's double-breasted blue blazer, and then it was wrapped again in an old quilt. Her arms and her legs were discovered in a makeshift box that was made, like, not very long before that. And they were also wrapped in butcher paper, brown butcher paper, and held together by rubber bands. Her head, her head was also similarly wrapped with the brown butcher paper and the bands. So... This discovery is when Kerner Gerber figured out that some of the body parts had been refrigerated. It showed signs of refrigeration. And when they were... So, coroner's there. All the police are there. They were looking for more pieces of her. And that's when they discovered the second body. Now, the second body was only a few yards away. And where these bodies were is in plain view of Elliot Ness's office. And this is as if the killer wanted to taunt him. Be like, hey, hey, look at there you go. There's two murder victims on a silver platter. <sighs> yeah. So Jane Doe the fourth, um, she was a skeleton. Uh, she had been dead anywhere between four to six months, aged between 30 and 40. Decapitation, well, decapitation wasn't determined as cause of death. It was actually homicide because they couldn't definitively determine it. And she had, there was light brown hair remnants on the body. Uh, John Doe the sixth, he was also skeletonized. He was dead anywhere between seven to nine months. Um, homicide, again, is the cause of death. And he was aged anywhere between 30 and 40. So... With him, when they found him, his bones were found wrapped in butcher paper and his skull was in a tin can. Kind of like presented as a gift. Like, here you go. So, this would be the last murder case because, well, that would happen in this area. And after this is when they would receive a letter stating that the killer had vacationed in California 
and that would lead us to tomorrow's case. But I also wanted to mention that they do have a police museum, and in this museum they have, they call death masks. So basically it's a casting of four of the victims' faces, and that is of Edward Andrassy, Florence Polillo, the tattooed man, and Jane Doe number one. They have their face cast on the wall, along with different like pictures and information when it comes to the case. They have this in Cleveland, and it's part of just like one small expo in this museum. Yeah, so clearly this case has never been solved. And I mean, I hope, I hope that this case will eventually become solved because it's, it would be nice to, or either that, figure out who these people are. Because even if they are hobos or transients, it would be nice to finally, like, give them their identity back and be able to bury them. Yeah. Yeah. So the other... I already talked about Dr. Francis Sweeney. Now, well, a little bit. He... He was a suspect, and then there was also a man named Frank Dolezal. Now, Frank Dolezal was just, he was ruled out, absolutely ruled out. He was arrested in suspicion of Florence's murder, um, and he died of mysterious circumstances while he was waiting in jail. Yeah. So, uh, with Sweeney, they, because he was a doctor, that... It's one of the reasons why they suspected him. And he also was personally interviewed by Elliot Ness, who oversaw the investigation of the killings. And during the investigation, he noticed that Sweeney was drunk. So they put him in a hotel room for three days, told him to sober up. And during the investigation is when they gave Sweeney a polygraph and he failed I mean, he's drunk, so what do you expect? But still, Ness believed he had his man, but it turned out he wasn't. There was no chance of him being this, being this person. Sweeney would then threaten to harass Ness later on in the 50s with like postcards and stuff like that. And he would do so from his hospital confinement but it stopped after he died, and he died in 1964. Yeah. So, this case has literally, like, so sensationalized and so fucked up, and that's why I wanted to cover this, because people, and the little things that I found, there's, like, odd little, little things that people don't discuss in their videos that like the dude's skull was found in a tin can or the way that it's wrapped or things that are found with these like Jane Doe number three nobody talks about the damage to her cervix or that she had a c-section scar there's different things like that it's like man I just want to know it but I hope you guys enjoyed today's case of the Cleveland Torso Murders. If you did, hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe. And I'll see you tomorrow for our final day of the 25 Days of True Crime, which is the Black Dahlia murder. Bye, you guys. But the fire keeps us warm. We can spend the night.